Okay. I know. You're like, why do we do that? Because I'm just trying to give you some ideas. Some ideas. Some ideas of how we do things, right? So it's easy to solve that equation, right? QS equals blah, 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 P. QD equals blah, 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 P. QS equals QD, pfft. But then we can start adding things in there. Let's put a tax on. Let's put a tax that's a percentage of the price. Let's put a tax that's... Yes? Yeah. Let's put a tariff on and see what happens. All right? There's all these things is is that we can do. Okay? We could have attached that T to the P and solved it that way. Right? We could have said that that T is part of the P here and played with stuff and, t and all kinds of stuff we could have done, all right? Because we're economists and we like to think. So here's GDP. GDP is consumption, investment, and government spending, right? So this is GDP, consumption, investment, government spending. Now, we're going to try to solve for... GDP on the idea that consumption consumption is endogenous. It's determined inside our world and I and G are exogenous. They're given to us. Okay? So this is the way we've, when we do our first macro models, when we do math in macro the first time, this is what we do. Let's just put this equation into there. So Y equals A plus B Y plus I plus G. Okay? Is this exciting? Yeah. No? Yeah. Eh. So what does Y equal? Y equals A plus B Y plus I plus G. So Y minus B Y equals A plus I plus G, right? So 1 minus B times Y equals A plus I plus G. So GDP Y equals A plus I plus G divided by 1 minus B. Now you're saying, again, why? Why, 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 why? Well, let's look at this equation. If we had our macro class, what's B? B has a name. B is the MPC, the multiple marginal propensity to consume, the MPC, the marginal propensity to consume. I can take this equation and write it out differently. I can say Y equals 1 divided by 1 minus B times A plus I plus G. Yeah. What's that? Well, that's the multiplier. If you remember 103, you were told that in Keynesian economics, there's a multiplier effect. Well, that's the multiplier. 1 divided by 1 minus B times A plus I plus G. Okay? You're like, <laughs> oh, please no. Okay? Let's suppose now that B is 0.8. That if you give me an extra dollar of income, I spend 8 tenths of it. That G equals 40. That I equals 50. Okay, and that A equals 150. So now what do I do? I say Y equals 1 minus, right, 0 0.8 times 150 plus 50 plus 40 equals 5 times 240 equals 1,200. And that's GDP is 1,200. Now you're saying, why'd we do that? 
Well, we did. Except that if we're an economist, now we start asking questions. There's government spending in this, right? But there's no taxes. What happens when we put taxes into this equation? What happens if we make the budget balanced between taxes and government spending? So that we force, so that we say C equals A plus B Y minus T. And we put that into the equation, right? So that Y equals A plus B Y minus T plus I plus G. Yes? Yeah. Well, now I can see what effect taxes have. And if I balance the budget and make G and T the same, I can figure out what effect that's going to have. This is 0.8, right? So if I make G and T equal, I have a 0.8 T against a whole G. And even though G and T are equal, which is going to have a bigger effect on the system? Well, G is going to have a bigger effect on the world than T, because when T appears in the equation, it's got a 0.8 in front of it, and the G has a 1. You can't see the 1, but there's a 1 in front of it. So government spending is more effective at increasing the economy than taxes are at decreasing it in this model. And so our prediction is even if we have a balanced budget and we keep the budget balanced, increases in government spending that are matched by increases in taxes are still going to affect the economy. A lot less than if this wasn't here, but it's still there. Okay, and we can start making predictions again. Remember that math gives us hypotheses that we can go test and see if this model works. So what happens if we balance the budget? What happens if we increase both G and T? What happens if the budget is unbalanced and so we increase G? What happens if investment falls? What ha okay, this model is full of predictions we can make. Okay, so we can make T equal to G. We can also come up with an equation for T. T equals blah, 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 blah. And then put that in the, and the you with me? Yeah, you're not as happy as you were. But the point is, again, that we can take this equation where we get this simple equation that we know, right? Y equals C plus I plus G and C equals A plus BY. Those are two very basic, very common equations that we have in macro that we use all the time in basic macro in 103 or even in 303. And from those equations, then we can start analyzing what happens if B changes, what happens if A changes, what happens if I changes, what happens if G changes, what happens if in addition to this we have a B times T out here. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Now you're all fired up, yeah? Fired up. Fired up. We're fired up. Are we not fired up? Yeah, I think we are. We're fired up. And again, what we need to do in this, if you're saying we're doing all that, I don't. Yeah. Chapter 2, Chapter 3. Really, we're not. We're doing stuff that, to get you ready. And we're doing stuff which is sort of, you know, kind of what economists do, but we're not nearly at the level that we're going to be in a couple more chapters. Okay? This is just to get you this idea that, hey, hey, we can do some very simple math that lets us ask some questions. Now, we have hypotheses. We have questions. We have something behind us theorizing how life works okay and let's get even more comp complicated for a second let's do something called general equilibrium so in general equilibrium we have more than one market and again Hopefully you took macro and you're going to take macro again 
as an econ grad student, so you took it, hopefully you took 303, you're going to take 303 as an undergrad, and then as a grad student, you're going to take gradual macro, okay? And a lot of what we talk about in general macro is something called DSGE, which is Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Models. So a lot of macroeconomists use DSGE, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Models. And what that means is that we have a set of markets in the economy. So we have, you know, we have a goods market, and this is way oversimplified. It's, and the critics of DSGEs go, hey, it's... but you have a market for goods, you have a market for labor, you have a market for money, and you have a market for bonds. Okay. If you took 303, you probably did something called ISLM, which is a general equilibrium model. Okay, Not necessarily a very good one, but it's a general equilibrium model. Now, let's suppose, let's just suppose that this goods market is out of equilibrium. So we have a surplus of goods, right? We have too many goods. Well, if businesses, if businesses are not selling what they produce, what is going to happen in the labor market? So you own a restaurant and all of a sudden, pandemic hits, your sales go away. Well, you're going to lay off workers. So this imbalance in the goods market is going to be matched by an imbalance in the labor market. Is that exciting? Imbalance in the good market is going to be balanced by an imbalance in the labor market. As the goods market fixes itself, the labor market will should fix itself together. So as the goods market heads toward equilibrium again, right? The business is going to match supply and demand for the product. That's going to force a change in the labor market, which is going to balance. And those two markets are always going to be balanced, or maybe not, or maybe there's right. Obviously, you got four markets, so you can start playing with what happens if this, what happens with that, and you can talk about the interaction between markets, which is not something we do in a principles class, right? We say, look, here's the, the supply and demand for marshmallows, and here's the price and quantity of marshmallows, okay? We don't really draw sets of graphs. We talk about how the price of cocoa could affect the demand for marshmallows, but we don't really put a set of graphs out there that has the market for cocoa and the market for Right, and the market for marshmallows and the market for workers that make marshmallows and the market for capital that we use to make them. Okay? So if we try something like this, and you're like, no. <laughs> so we have two goods cleverly called 1 and 2. What this equation says is that demand for 1 and 2 are related. That if the price of 2 goes up, the quantity demanded for D1 will go down. So what's the relationship between these two goods? If the price of good 2 goes up, the quantity demanded of good 1 goes down. That means these goods are complements. Maybe? Okay. Okay. So now we have four equations, and we're going to have two equilibrium equations. That we have equilibrium in market one and equilibrium in market two. That we have simultaneously equilibrium in both markets. Now we have whole sets of equations. You're like, please, no. So we can set these first two equations equal to each other. We're not going to be able to solve them. Why not? Well, I got one, two, three variables with two equations. 
And down here, I'm not going to be able to solve that either. But if I do them all together, I might be able to solve them, yes? Yes.